This is Have You Met. My guest today is a Chief Learning Officer, Director of the Mentoring Academy, a contributor for Psychology Today and Forbes magazines, and recently won the Thinkers 50 Radar Award. We talk all about success, what makes high achievers tick, and her recently published book, The Success Factor, developing the mindset and skill set for peak business performance. In preparation for her book, she interviewed all sorts of high achievers from Hall of Fame Olympians to astronauts, some of which happen to have been on this very podcast. Have you met? Ruth Gautian. So Ruth, tell me a little bit about your background, how you became a chief learning officer in anesthesiology and what exactly that is. My job is to make people successful. I tap into their untapped potential and take them from high potential to high achiever. And it actually started long ago. My my first two degrees, my bachelor's and master's were in business. And I started working in finance and banking and quickly realized that just because you're good at something doesn't mean you enjoy doing it. And I mm-hmm. always loved working in education and higher education. So I left finance and went to work with students who are getting the dual MD and PhD degree. They're learning to be physicians and scientists. Three and a half percent acceptance rate to this program I ran. Oh. And I quickly realized that while everyone was worried about all those people who are leaving the profession, sort of like this great resignation that we're seeing now in the workplace, I was more interested in the other end of the spectrum. Those whose work is so incredible, such high impact that it more than makes up for anybody who's leaving. Those are the people I wanted to focus on. So at the age of 43, while working full-time and raising my family, I went back to school and got my doctorate. And I've been studying success ever since. So it started with physician scientists and Nobel Prize winners and people like that. And then once I figured out what made them successful, I said, hmm, I wonder if other high achievers do the same thing. But I wanted extreme high achievers. So I've been interviewing astronauts and Olympic champions, CEOs and, you know, interesting people like that. And then figured out that they're all the same. The astronaut is just like an Olympian. And if that's the case, that means these are learned skills. Being a high achiever is a learned skill. And if it's a learned skill, I'm an adult educator. I can teach it to adults. So I reverse engineered the process, created a blueprint, give talks about it all over the world. And I just came out with my book, The Success Factor, where I talk about it. So I teach people how to be successful. Awesome. So when you were like crossing paths with all these, uh, you know, scientists and and high achieving uh, Nobel Prize winners and all that kind of thing. What was it that piqued your interest about them? Was it just the, the innate nature of the fact they were successful or was there something about their, their personality or or how they came across that made you think, hmm, I want to like know more about what's behind this? My definition of success, because success changes based on who you ask. And that was actually yeah. the early part of my research is how you define it. But my my definition that I worked with, and that was the first two phases of my research. It's somebody who has created a paradigm shift in the way we think about things, the way we do things and what they've achieved. We now do things differently because of what they did. So that was the first step. The second step is as they are achieving greatness and they're recognized by others for the great work that they're doing, they are lifting other people up as they move up. So it's not just about them. It's about bringing other people. That was my definition. And that's why you don't see these big, um, famous reality stars in the book, The Success Factor. These are people who have completely changed the way we do things. Those Mm. were the people that I was interested in. So it's people, very famous people that you've heard about from um, the NBA and from Um, astronauts and Olympians and things like that. But it's also people who have done such incredible things and they are not household names, but they are definitely people who I think that you should know about. So Mm. there really is the mix of those kinds of people. And they, these are people who I think have really changed the world and have the capacity to change the world. And frankly, I think all of us can do our part. So the success factor really teaches people how to do that. If you don't want to aim for average, if you want to aim for success, but haven't really figured out how to do that, I wanted to use my adult education background plus my research on extreme high achievers to teach people how to do that. 
Awesome. You mentioned in there as well that part of it was that these people are helping others as well. They're, they're lifting others up, helping others achieve their goals too. Um, and all that kind of thing. Was there anybody that you spoke to or did you come across anybody that really conflicted with that and had had like achieved success typically, but then not helped other people and, and maybe kind of neglected relationships? Never, like that? Really? never. The, every single one of them had, they were surrounded by other people, by mentors and a mentoring team, and they constantly lifted other people. And they did it either one-on-one by helping people. So for example, Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Bob Lefkowitz, he mentored over his career 200 people. He even shared his Nobel Prize with one of his former mentees. Mm. And then there are other people who have created entire programs. So two-time NBA champion, Zaza Pachulia, he created a basketball academy in his home country of Georgia. Mm. Dr. Charlie Camarda, one of the NASA astronauts, when he retired from NASA, he actually developed a nonprofit foundation called the Epic Education Foundation, because he realized that if we were going to do this great work in outer space, we needed people who were thinking differently, not just thinking out of the box, but throwing away the box, people who knew how to take strategic risks, The problem is we don't learn how to take strategic risks and we are afraid of failure. So he created an entire foundation where he now teaches students and educators how to take these strategic risks and think bigger and bolder and fail early, small, and often in order to achieve that success. So he teaches the students and he teaches the educators. And this is what he's doing in retirement. Yeah. So if you can imagine, these are the kind of people that they are. Yeah, that's awesome. I think a lot of that, is, that that's kind of a NASA, gives me NASA vibes, that whole throw away the box and like yeah. look for the, uh, the thing that's totally not on anybody's mind, the, the, un, the unthought of solution. Um, yeah. How, how many astronauts did you talk to? Well, I, I interviewed many of them. There are four of them that are actually in the book. So obviously I interviewed many more than I have Mm. in the book, but sometimes the stories, I didn't want the stories to start repeating themselves, but I, I had, I I think I selected some really incredible ones. I have Dr. Peggy Whitson, who is the former Mm. chief astronaut for NASA. Now what's interesting about her story is talking about failure and rejection. She was turned down repeatedly over 10 years when she applied to be an astronaut. She was turned down. She ultimately, for 10 years, and she did not give up. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, she became NASA's chief astronaut. She became the first female commander of the International Space Station, something she did twice. Mm -hmm. And she spent more days in space than any American astronaut of any gender. And she was turned down for 10 years. So talk about resilience and lessons that we can learn yeah. And for her, it was really interesting because she was mentored early on. All of these high achievers were mentored early on. And, um, you know, she wanted to do things differently and she found people who believed in her. So that's one astronaut. Another astronaut is a physician who is also an astronaut mm. who also climbed Mount Everest. Yeah. Who also was in the Olympics as a coach in luge. I know where you're going with this one. (laughs) So talk about people who do things completely differently. There is no one path. That That one's the great part, the great Scott Parazinski for anybody listening or (gasps) watching. uh, Yeah. Spoil that one. Uh, (laughs) The the luge gave it away, you know, the, the, the... (laughs) yeah. Now, What's interesting is that these, you know, these astronauts all know each other and, and, and you know, Scott and what incredible story that mm. Scott has, right? Yeah, what an yeah. incredible story. So, you know, he's just one of them and, and Charlie, and then of course, um, Nicole Stott, who, um, she's interesting because she was a, she's a painter and she actually took the first watercolor paint set to space and was painting from mm. there. She just came out with her own book, but what she's really known for, (laughs) I mean, she's a, she's a brilliant engineer and, and, and a brilliant, um, uh, astronaut, but she was in a Super Bowl commercial and that's how a lot of people know her. (laughs) Oh, right. Yeah. 
It says everything. They're, re- <laughs> they're regular people. And you know, Scott, regular person. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really nice guy. Really down to earth though as well. Mm-hmm. And like, but, but it's clear that, that there's something yeah, special going on behind the scenes there with the drive and the, the you know, the, yeah. the perseverance, the passion. Um, before we carry on talking about success and the people you talked to, to, to for your book and your book in general, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your success. I know there's been lots of it, but more recently you did, uh, you won this Thinkers 50 Radar Award. And I wonder yes. if you could just spend a couple of minutes telling me a bit more about the Thinkers 50, what that is, and about this award. And of course, congratulations. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. So that that's a story. That That's a story. <laughs> um, so Thinkers 50 is, they are the number one platform that ranks, rates, and reviews the, the top management thinkers in the world. And last year, I made what's called the Radar List, which is the top 30 emerging management thinkers to watch. Mm. And then this year, I won the, um, in November, the radar award for the number one emerging management thinker in the world. And it's because of my work on success and mentoring, but I I want to tell you what happened in the green room behind the scenes, because it was so surreal. And this is not something you can ever Google because this is what happened. So what's interesting is I was asked by the, the founders of thinkers 50, if I could please host the green room. Now, when you're on the radar list for Thinkers 50, these are like the top 30 people in the world, right? They actually was so great about Thinkers 50 for the people who are part of that family. They actually have speakers and we learn, we get to learn every single month from these incredible people. And I'm an extrovert. I've been studied 95% extrovert. I can carry a conversation with anybody. So they asked me to please host the green room for the people who were shortlisted. And I said, sure. Well, here I am doing my job. I'm type A. So, you know, I I need to, I needed to look everyone up and, and, and really, you know, get everyone going and chatting. And all of a sudden they pull me out of the green room and I'm in some other room. And I said, well, what did I do wrong? I thought I did my job. Well, all of a sudden they start talking about the radar award. And I said, Oh, wait a minute. I'm shortlisted for that. What, what's happening here? And then all of a sudden they pull me on the main stage and they announced my name. I don't really know what happened after that. I think they asked me a series of questions. I have no idea how I answered. I'm really afraid to watch the video <laughs> again, <laughs> but that's, that's what it was. And then when the award ceremony was over, Dr. Marshall Goldsmith, who is the number one executive coach in the world, he was named that multiple times. And he actually wrote the forward to my book, The Success Factor. He called me up and he said, Ruth, your life is going to change now. I said, Marshall, what do you mean? He said, mark my words, your life is going to change. And one of the things that I have learned from Marshall Goldsmith, and I'm part of his 100 coaches, is that when Marshall speaks, you listen. So I am taking this all in. I am living it and I am learning from these incredible people. And the most amazing thing about being part of Thinkers 50 is that you will always be the least interesting person in the room because you can learn so much from every single person on that list. They're brilliant. They're nice. They're humble and they're incredible. Yeah. Wow. That must be a, a really nice feeling to be put in that company with those people and people that you admire and, and respect. So and, admire. Yeah. And now you're in that with them. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Still not quite sunk in? Or? <laughs> it, it, hasn't, it hasn't sunk in at all. And in fact, when the award came in, I sort of left it in the box for a little bit because I said, oh, maybe, maybe it was a mistake and they're going to ask for it. <laughs> But they haven't asked for it back. Uh, they said it's definitely mine, uh, so I'm keeping it. <laughs> Pretty heavy too. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's very cool. You got an actual heavy award. That's that's very yeah. Cool. It's oh, beautiful. Wow. You need to get some shelves <laughs> behind you for these kind of calls, so you have it there in uh, display right behind you. Uh, your how about I display this instead? That could be on the <laughs> other side. You can have one one of each on either side. <laughs> um, Ruth, why do some people thrive where others don't? 
and and like why and and how like what do you you've been into this in detail you've looked into this Mm -hmm. how do you kind of summarize an answer to that yeah so why do some people achieve and others just remain at average i i really think that the you know, everybody wants to succeed. I don't think anybody is aiming for average, but what happens is a lot of people talk about one day, one day I'm going to do this and one day I'm going to do that. And one day I'm going to do the other thing. The high achievers don't wait for one day. They don't wait for perfection. Instead of one day, they make today day one and they start working towards that goal. And they don't start talking about the million ideas they have. They're super focused and they're concise in what they say. And they are focused on getting that going. They don't talk about the problems. They are not a no problem, too small mentality. They start thinking about what is the challenge I need to solve? How am I going to solve it? And that is what they focus on. Turning one day into day one. That's what'll mm-hmm. that's that mindset that'll start shifting you into becoming a high achiever because you're making these incremental changes. And if you start working towards your goal a little at a time, you will get there. Do you think that all these Olympians were born Olympians? No. Little things every single day. Control what you can control. Start seeing what is what is in your control that you can change, that you can focus on, and then do that. Yeah. Did you find with with these all these different people you spoke to? Did you did you find they had kind of most of them had one? specific focus in in their life did did you ever come across people or often or ever come across people that had multiple hobbies multiple passions multiple things they enjoyed or was it all more often very focused on one thing if it's a horribly worded question but you know what i'm getting no (laughs) i know exactly what you're what you're going at they actually tried a few things out which is what we do as kids right we have yeah. all these uniforms from all these after school activities that we did, but yet we don't do that as adults. Mm. But they actually learned to do that. So Apollo Anton Ono is the most decorated winter Olympian, short track uh, speed skating. He was actually a state champion swimmer before he was ever a short track speed skater. And he said he did that, but he never really loved it. Mm. So he was good at it. And that's the difference between being good at something and enjoying something. And then one day he tried out the short track speed skating and really loved it so much so that at the age of 14, he left home where he was raised by his single dad, went across country to Lake Placid to train with the others. So in that, he says he loves. And recently he actually posted something on Twitter. You know, he's retired from the sport, but he laced up his skates and he got on the ice and, you know, he did a little reel. And you see that joy that joy in his face about loving that speed skating Mm. so much. That's what we need to find. We need to find that passion. And one of the things I I have done in the success factors actually teach people how to find this success. So I don't just talk about what other people did. I'm an adult educator. I actually teach people how to do that for themselves. So one of the things in the book, that's one of the downloadable, um, um, worksheets that you can have the resources is to actually teach you how to do your own passion audit to figure that out can you give a little spoiler on on how to do that like how to find your passion because i'm sure lots of people don't really know what it is and i'm sure some people you know think they're passionate about something but it's really not the thing that you, yeah. you know you wake up and you, you wake up you're like oh i can't wait to do this and you go to bed and you're like oh, i'm looking forward to getting up and doing that tomorrow um like i think that Quite, can be quite rare and can be quite hard to find maybe um yeah but i can agree like so strongly that if you find that thing it probably gives you a major kind of head start on becoming you know that that typical idea of successful that we talked about like um because yeah if you enjoy it you're able to live it breathe it think it all the time your your spare time is going into that even if it's just reading about you know fringe ideas right. to do with it yeah that's right. And so I actually share with people some questions they should be asking your, themselves. And there's a difference between being good at something and really enjoying it. Mm. So what are the things that you are good at? What are the things that you are not good at? What are the things that you are good at, but you don't enjoy? What are the things that you would do for free if you could? What are the things that you procrastinate doing? And when you're procrastinating, what are you doing instead? These are all clues mm. that will lead you to figuring out what it is that you are passionate about. But What's important to understand is that what you're passionate about now can change. 
Yeah. So just because you enjoyed it in the past doesn't mean you enjoy it now. And this is especially true when you have transitions in your life, a move, a new partner, a new child, a new job, a pandemic. So that's why this passion audit is something that you can download and do repeatedly mm. because every time you have a transition, it's something that you need to reconsider and think about. Yeah. Do you, so do you need to get the book to find this passion audit or is that on your website or something? Um, I actually put the passion audit, uh, a version of it on my website. So you can just go to ruthgotian.com slash passion audit. Cool. I'll try and link that in the description. So scroll down to find out what you're passionate about. Um, you know, I was interested to, to know if you found any correlation between, again, it doesn't have to be specifically these things, but things like uh, upbringing, parental status, disabilities, be it mental, physical, um, you know, like, yeah, the, when I say parental status and upbringing, like the kind of wealth and, and maybe the the jobs or how successful the parents were, different things like that. I don't know if you were looking at it from that angle, but yeah some some had it and some didn't so it was not enough to be significant some were mm. actually raised with um well the the scientists in particular some were raised with parents who were physicians or scientists so they grew up in that world but not everyone was right so yeah. the athletes were not children of other athletes so one of the people um who i um interviewed was devin harris so if you ever saw the movie mm. cool running i'm actually going to be talking to devon in a few weeks i've actually got him oh, booked already awesome. i did not know you yeah i didn't realize you had him in your book so that's a nice little <laughs> devin <laughs> harris is an original member of the jamaican bobsledding team so he you know his, the story of devon and his teammates was in the movie cool runnings yeah and great movie <laughs> great movie now he is he is not from wealth. He is not from an Olympic family. He is from an Olympic country, right? The Jamaicans mm. are known for track, but he's not in track. He's in bobsledding. So he actually tried out for track and, and didn't make it. And then when it was decided that Jamaica would have a bobsledding team, which is a whole other story, how that came about, he tried out, but remember he's from a tropical island. They don't have snow, let alone ice. Yeah. So he, you know, completely in the unknown, he didn't even know who his teammates were going to be until they met at the airport on their way to Lake Placid. When they got to Lake Placid, that was the first time he saw a bobsled and the first time he saw a track and he's afraid of speed and heights, which he will tell you. So he did not grow up from that, right? The astronauts are not mm. second generation astronauts, no. but they had something inside them that they were not willing to say no. And all of them were surrounded by a team of mentors who believed in them more than they believed in themselves. And that's why having a team of mentors is so important if you want to achieve greatness. Yeah. Wow. That is, I love that coincidence, by the way, as well. It's a great, I, I really Tell didn't Devin realize I say that, hi. That, I know a load of the people like that, that are in your book but he's one of the names I didn't realize actually that's that's in there so yeah I, I, I will um I have a show I have a show um through the mentor project called optimizing your success where I bring in um you know many of the high achievers from the book and then I have some panelists of high achievers who help me ask questions and Devin is one of those high achievers who's there every week to bring in awesome. another perspective Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. I wonder if we'll find any other like guests that I've had that you interviewed. So we well. know so we got Scott, Scott, we know Devin. Devin. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Um, how many people did you interview overall for the book? Oh, a lot. Over 100, but there's over 60 in the who are profiled in the book. Yeah. Okay, cool. And how, like, this is the big question. How, how on earth did you choose them? You know, was it, was it that you contacted a thousand people and even choosing a thousand would be hard, but was it that you contacted more and some got back or was it a very, very selective process of these are the ones I want? So, you know, it really started out with the physician scientists. That's how I started because of where I worked, I had access to some of the best mm. of them. And then when people get to know, like, and trust you, they actually want to start referring you to other people. So that's how I got some of those. And then, you know, all you need is one. So I met one astronaut who introduced me to several other astronauts. I met, you know, one Olympian who introduced me to several other Olympians. Um, so it's really getting people once they know, like, and trust you. So most of the people I knew a few. And then once people heard I was doing the research, they started sending people my way. But I had very, mm -hmm. very strict criteria of what I was looking for. So most of the people that were sent my way, I actually did not 
reach out to. But then other people, I obviously had to do my due diligence to see that they were the types of people that I was looking for, people who created that paradigm shift in the way Mm -hmm. we were thinking and gave back and lifted other people up. And that's why I have the the eclectic mosaic of people that I have, everyone from a Tony Award winner to an astronaut to an Olympian to somebody who argued 45 cases before the Supreme Court of the United States. Another person changed the way we diagnose depression in nursing homes to eight-time NBA champion Steve Kerr to Dr. Tony Fauci, who's leaving, uh, who's leading the uh, the way we are dealing with the COVID pandemic in the United States. I mean, so there's so many different types of people mm-hmm. and that's really what I wanted, an eclectic yeah. mix. Yeah, kind of like this podcast as well. You know, that's, that's what I go for too. I, <laughs> the best um, way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so again, with these people, um, were there, who were like the, were there anybody that was particularly memorable or any particularly memorable stories? Of course, they all are in their own way. And of course, they've all got memorable stories. But was there anything that really stands out or anybody that stands out for, for any particular reason? I think they all do for very, very different ways and very different reasons. But one of the things that really surprised me, I would always ask the Olympians, for example, at the end of our interview, can you show me your medal? Mm or medals, as many of them had. I think Apollo, oh no, I think had eight. And it was fascinating to me that they didn't have them on display. Only two of them had it on display. I thought they'd have a trophy room. No. One had it under their bed in a box. Another had it in a safe. One of them had it in a brown paper bag in his sock drawer. Another had it in his nightstand. It was never, and I said to them, I said, I don't understand this. I'd be wearing it around the house. I'd be wearing it to go to the supermarket. He said, no, no, no. It was never about the medal. That was a chapter in my life, not the entire story. Mm. And several of them, when they actually showed me their favorite medal, so those who had several, I asked them to show me their favorite, and it was not always the gold. Mm. So Apollo Ono the most decorated winter Olympian did not show me his gold. He actually showed me his silver, which he said was his first medal. And every single one, as they were holding their medal, you could see their entire demeanor change because they actually talked about, um, you, you could see that the emotion and the feeling that went into it and how much work went into it. But they were very clear that it was a chapter in their lives and they were on to doing the next thing and they were just thrilled for that experience yeah that's very cool though yeah that is and i can really see that the the idea of having yeah not the gold always you know it's the one with the most sentimental value the one where oh this is the one where i fell on my face and and had to you know that was the process i had to build myself back up and that's the one thing that changed my life and you know nice little stories like that that's right cool did uh, did all the astronauts that you spoke to, did you talk to them about like how going to space and looking back at Earth and stuff and how that kind of changed them or how it affected them? You did. Did, yeah. what, what were the, did you have the same answer from everybody uh, along the, the same lines or? It was interesting. It's also about the long preparation for mm. it. And most of the time it's actually spent on Earth, not in space. Yeah. And I was very curious, you know, what I really thought was interesting was, and I learned a lot from them early in the pandemic, I interviewed a lot of them about when all of us were, were at home and we were wondering how we're ever going to survive this. We're working from home. We're living here. We're in the same space 24 seven. I actually reached out to many of the Olympians and I said, look, you're in a tin can in the sky <laughs> for weeks <laughs> on end where your workspace and your personal space is one and the same, what tips do you have? And they really learn to um, compartmentalize certain parts of their lives. And they really start learning to understand the simple things that are so important about being able to eat regular food, actually sleep in a bed, lying down, Everyone has their own ways, but learning how to actually work together was actually so very important because it's not like you're fired. Where are you going to go? You know, (laughs) they all have to learn to actually work together and learning how to do that. That's actually what they spend a lot of time on earth doing. Mm. And I think they realize that all of that preparation was for something bigger. 
And I think knowing that and learning from those failures and those opportunities and from each other to me was, was really something that we need to learn how to do as well. Yeah. Conflict resolution and, and learning to get along. Yeah, yeah. It seemed quite simple, but you're definitely right. We definitely need to learn how to do not those better. Not simple. Not simple. <laughs> <laughs> no, should be, should be simple, but definitely not. <laughs> um, so what did these high achievers, these extreme high achievers and highly successful people that you interviewed, what did they all have in common? And what did they have like that? Was there, were there lots of things that were totally different? Did they have some of the things that were just random, like their approach to, I don't know, X, Y, and Z? But, but yeah, talk to me a little bit about the similarities and differences, if you could. So there's four things that they all had in common. And that's what really I, the, the whole platform of what I think these are learned skills. So the first one is they have all found their passion and purpose. What it is that they love to do what they would do for free if they could. And they get to do that every day. Imagine if we could do that. So that's the first one is, is intrinsic motivation. It's never about the diplomas, the awards, the gold money. medal, the money. It's, that's when other people judge you. And when other people judge you, that's not sustainable. You will either fail out or burn out. Mm. So they tap into something that doesn't matter what other people think. They're doing it for themselves and they created a whole career around it. That's passion. That's intrinsic motivation. That's the first one. The second one is their work ethic. When you find what it is that you love to do, you are going to outwork everybody. And I don't mean that you're putting in eight hour, 18 hour days. What I mean is you are going to leverage your optimal time. You're, you learn how to work smarter Yeah. Be, because that is the most important part, not just the hours that you put in, but what you're actually putting into the hours. Definitely. The third one is a strong foundation, which you're constantly reinforcing what you did early in your career. You're going to do late in your career. One of the people I spoke to is Ryan Millar, who's a three-time Olympian, won the gold medal in volleyball. He told me that the warm-up before any game is something called pepper because you work on ball control because in volleyball, ball control is the most important thing. He said that pepper, that drill that he did before the Olympic Games, same thing he did in his backyard with his brother when he was seven years old, because that is the fundamental skill. He doesn't say, I made it to the Olympics. I don't need to do that drill anymore. No, that's why every NBA star you hear about all the warmups that they do. It's the same exact warmups you'd seen in any seventh grade gym. It hasn't changed. They just have better sneakers and more money. Mm -hmm. And the last one is that all of these high achievers, despite all of their accolades and all of their degrees, they're constantly learning. They're continuous lifelong learners and they do it through informal means. They're not sitting in a classroom. So the billionaires we know, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and Mark Cuban, they read three to eight hours a day. But there are other ways that you can learn if you don't enjoy reading so much. So you can read books and articles and blogs and listen to podcasts such as this one. Hopefully I'm sharing some good stuff and videos and LinkedIn learning. I mean, it's really quite endless. Yeah. And of course, you can learn from other people, which is why all of the extreme high achievers surround themselves with a team of mentors. So those are the four passion, work ethic, strong foundation and informal learning. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I, the first one, like we said about intrinsic motivation and, and the passion, that's yeah, you, you're not going to do anything without that. The last one, informal learning, like the constant informal learning. I thought that was really interesting because it's something maybe you can kind of get into the mindset where you're like, oh, I shouldn't do that because it's, you know, I, I need to do that. I need to do some work. I need to do this. I need to do that. So I shouldn't watch this documentary or read this, you know, article about this thing I find interesting. But it is interesting to hear you say that, that that's exactly where the little tidbits and little things that, you know, it might just be that one little fact that you're going to learn or one person right. you're going to learn about that might change your day um, or change a lot more than your day. You know, you might just stumble across that in, as you say, informal learning, even if it's not even a documentary, even if it's watching a film, you know, That's there's right. going to be an idea in a film or, or a novel. Um, yeah, really cool. Did you, so did you find anybody of these high, high achievers that went against that? Were there any, were there any that didn't seem nope. to fit these criteria? Every there's no one, one that was like, I'm four. just motivated by money. <laughs> No, every single one did all four of those things. And what's most important is that you have to do all four of the things simultaneously. Yeah. You can't pick and choose what you're going to do. But if you had to start with one, I would say start with the passion and do that passion audit. 
and then build on the others as well. You can't do one without doing the others. You will not achieve that greatness. Yeah. So when was the last time you did a passion audit? No, I do it all the time. Do it I do it time. at least once a year, at least once a year. What do you, sure. what do you find that you should be teaching or talking or writing? What were the kind of things? The big one that I did where I found the big monumental shift was when I realized I was doing operations for a long time and I realized that I was good at it, but I stopped enjoying it. I stopped enjoying doing operations and crisis management. You don't mean and surgery, do you? Because you are no. partly in the medical field, so I have to check. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, uh, operations meaning Just making mid incision. You're like, I'm sick of these bloody operations. Yeah, <laughs> making making sure all the trains run on time and that it's yeah. a well oiled machine. Yeah. And I realized that I needed a break from that. So that's when I really shifted more towards the education and the teaching and the writing. And I love, 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 love it. It it got me through the pandemic for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you just love to impart your, what you've learned, your wisdom. Um, do you, do you go around and talk to like schools and universities and things? And, and tell me about your mentoring stuff. Like, cause you, I'm guessing you have plenty of mentors yourself, but I feel like you're also, you, you do some volunteering, right? You're with an organization, the mentor. Yes. I'm with the mentor project, um, yeah. where it takes some of the most successful people in the world who then teach it to other people and they do it in different ways. There's some people who go to schools, other, um, people who give talks, other people who, um, run events, do hackathons, podcasts, videos. I mean, you you name it. There's different ways that it's done. So that is actually one of the places. That's my pride and joy. That's where I volunteer. And um, I've had many mentees of my own. I also talk all over at universities and organizations about the work that I am doing on success and mentoring and uh, wrote the book about it, the success factor, and also write about it in Forbes and psychology today and other journals to reach as many people as possible, because I really think success can be learned. Yeah. So with the work you've done with Forbes and psychology today, that's all kind of similar stuff to the book. Is it like all related to success and, and how to optimize yourself in essence, um, your yeah. brain? Yeah, I call my, I call thing. my column optimize success, optimizing success. Yeah. Nice. There you go. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so mentors, how would you define a mentor? What What is a mentor? I mean, we all kind of know what it is. Like I can tell you right now what it is, but, but how would you define? Cause again, I'm thinking people would have slightly different definitions of a mentor. Yeah. A mentor is long-term and they're somebody who help you in your career. They can teach you skills. They give you perspectives. You can tap into their network. Most importantly, they believe in you more than they believe in themselves. They believe that you have this potential and they help get it out of you. And they are your guide by your side for the long term. And they actually have two roles. The first one is to help you with your career. And the second one is really the psychosocial support to be your cheerleader by the side. This is the work mm -hmm. of Kathy Cram out of Boston. And a great example of that is that Nobel Prize winner, Do uh, Dr. Bob Lefkowitz, who really talks about all the mentors he's had through the years. And when he was originally doing research at the National Institutes of Health, nothing was working. It was a disaster. Nothing was working. And he was ready to call it quits. And it was actually his mentors who really cheered him on and said, look, I know this seems enormous right now. It seems like something that you'll never be able to get over. But this is just a bump in the road. And they really helped him put that into perspective. And now he has a Nobel Prize. Yeah, nice. Wow. Did you did you try and get a sit down with Tom Brady, by the way? That's uh see most of these people I um it, it was people who introduced me to him. So no one has yeah. yet introduced me to Tom Brady, to, but if you want to or know someone who can, I would be more than excited to talk to him. <laughs> I mean, he 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 prefers it when I keep his, you know, I don't I don't pass him around. He prefers to just, you know, <laughs> no. stay on the down low. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how it is when you're seven times mm -hmm. Super Bowl winner. Because yeah, he's a mind, like he's a quite a special mind as well. I'm, I'm sure he would fit those four things. And I'm sure he would agree with those four characteristics. Well, but yeah, well, Maybe Tom Brady is person. listening. And if he's listening, <laughs> you know, Tom, just reach out and we could definitely have a chat about success. 
yeah also i have patreon tom so uh really appreciate that <laughs> um so tell me uh we kind of maybe touched on it a little bit with these four things i mean you're going to tell me probably that anybody can apply them but can you give any advice for somebody listening or watching at home that would like to try and apply these things and would like to become more successful um is there any tips for implementing those things and like keeping yourself disciplined and all that kind of thing there are a lot of tips that i that i really that i talk about in the success factor in fact the last third of the book is all about how to implement the four mm. elements of success what kind of an adult educator would i be if i told you what to do and didn't teach you how to do it but what i actually did was i didn't tell you how to do it because what works for you wouldn't work for me mm. and what works for me today will not work for me the next time I do my passion audit and realize that things have shifted in my life and things that used to be important are not important to me anymore. So what I needed to do was create a buffet of options. This way you can choose what works for you. I can choose what works for me. And when it doesn't work for me now, I can go back to that buffet and change it. So I tell people, this is a book that you can keep on your nightstand. And when something's not working for you, you can look up other options as to how to reach that because there is a whole list of options there for you. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, look, Ruth, just to kind of finish us out today, I really appreciate your time. Um, I wonder if you could kind of, if you want to leave a little message from anybody watching or listening, just a few words. It doesn't have to be about anything specific. It could be a, a book pitch. It can be about something completely different. It could, it could be whatever you want it to be. Um, but just whatever you'd like to leave yeah. people with. Um, so one of the things that I learned from the extreme high achievers who I studied is that they fear not trying more than they fear failing. So I encourage everyone listening to figure out what it is that they are afraid to do and then try to do that anyway, because really what's the worst that would happen? Mm. What is the worst thing that would happen? So I'm hoping that the success factor can really help provide people with options and opportunities how to do that and i'm hoping that you love it yeah awesome based on that there is there is a lot to learn from trying and failing right that's good advice there's a lot to learn it's, from that it's right and it's all about how you approach those challenges and the high achievers approach them differently they never yeah. question if they will overcome a challenge they know that mm. they'll overcome the challenge Instead, they focus on how to overcome that challenge. What is that strategy I haven't thought of yet? And that's yeah. what they do. Awesome. Thanks so much for today, Ruth. This was great. Thank you so wish much you for having the best me. With your, wish you all the best with your book as well. I hope it, I hope it sells a lot. <laughs> Thank you. There it is. Scroll, scroll <laughs> it is. for links. <laughs> Take care, Ruth. Thank you. Thanks for listening to that conversation with Ruth Gotian. I hope you enjoyed it and took something from it. If you did, please consider subscribing to our channel. Find out how to buy Ruth's book and see all our other links in the description, along with our own. Check out my conversations with three of Ruth's extreme high achievers, Hall of Fame Olympian Chris Waddell, astronaut Scott Parazinski, and coming soon, Jamaican bobsled legend Devon Harris. Be nice, be happy, be cool.